one of the few times that I did actually talk to Ashley Judd, this came out of my mouth. I liked seeing you in heat and smoke. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Sincast, presented by CinemaSins. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Sincast. This is Chris Atkinson from CinemaSins, joined as always by the voice of CinemaSins, Jeremy Scott. Daw. <laughs> there I'm we gonna, go. I'm gonna do some foreign language every single every time. Every single time. I don't know time. what "da" means, and I couldn't think of the Russian. So I, just, <laughs> I mean, hello. Yes. I'll go. Maybe I'll just go back to hello or yo, because I, I've struck out twice now with my foreign language attempts. Mm, mm-hmm. uh, despite striking out, uh, they're also with us today. Uh, music video sends Barrett Share. Konnichiwa. There we go. Oh, uh, school me. That's right. Schooled me. I'm the only person here just speaking English. I'm racist. I'm so racist. Um, Today we're going to continue our series of best of the years we've been alive. We've been doing this now. This is the 21st, right? The 21st one we've done. Uh, Even though it's sort of the 20 year anniversary, quote unquote, Mm -hmm. of what we've been doing. We've been doing this since the 1975 year. And uh, I guess we can rehash that story again, Jeremy. Yeah, sure. So somebody had asked me a question, I think it was on Twitter, about, hey, go through all the years you've been alive and pick what you think the best movie is for that year. And it just felt like a meatier topic than Twitter or even a video. Um, and it, I think that's proven to be true. And now we're up all the way to 1995. Yeah, we're about ha- we're halfway through this. Yeah. You are a toy! Uh, what's in the box? I'm a dancer. Brother, you are going down. That little pig. Where are you going? I'm going to pick a fight. Ah, oh, as if. And like that, he's gone. 1995 is, uh, as we've discussed before, a great year. Mm-hmm. This was the year that I picked as uh, one of the best years ever or whatever, because it's just got a lot of just great movies in it. And when we did that, uh, we did that podcast way back when I picked this year and it's got so many good things about it. It's not 1994 as far as like number of legendary movies, yeah. but there's so many great movies yeah. in this. So, uh, what should start us off? I guess best picture was Braveheart. Mm. Uh-huh. Braveheart won in 1995. Uh, great movie. I really liked Braveheart. It's over the years. I have not watched it as much as I used to, though. Mm. I used to watch this a lot because mm-hmm. I used to really get excited about it. Now I'm used kinda, to come on all the time too. Yeah, yeah. I actually had the laser disc of Braveheart. What? The laser disc. <laughs> You're dating yourself, but that's I guess right. This whole podcast theme does. So. Yeah, wow. yeah. Um, but uh, but Braveheart. Uh, I think the thing about it is that over the years that those huge battles over all these fields and everything have become tiresome. Yeah, there's so many of them now. Like you know, it, but this back then. Nobody had done anything like that. It went to this scale, no. It was re- tremendously, I mean, a lot. I don't think they did, they didn't do much CGI. They did some, sure. I think, in this. But they still had a lot of extras yeah, in tons. this that made it look like it was real and everything. Whereas now, you would just go and do that in a computer and whatever. But uh, Braveheart, obviously not historically accurate by yeah. any any measure, but it's an exciting movie. It's, it's a fun movie. Yeah, it's brutal. Oh, it, yeah. it was really brutal for the time, too, which kind of made the realism more realistic, I guess. And uh, it's it's super quotable for, you know, a war movie, basically. Yeah. And everybody always forgets this is one of those Armageddon Deep Impact things because we also had Rob Roy this yep. year yeah. with Liam Neeson. And you want to talk about brutal. Yeah, that's true. That is one of the most brutal scenes. And I don't even want to talk about mm. it much. But Tim Roth, I hate you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, back to Braveheart, which is a much superior film. But uh, everybody always forgets Rob Roy came out the same year. I can't. I don't know where everybody stands on Mel Gibson's accent at this point, because when it first came out, everybody was saying, that's a pretty good Scottish brogue. And then there was a backlash to it to where it was saying, no, that's not Scottish at all. So I don't know where everybody settled. Do you guys have an opinion? I just uh, uh, no, I don't. I just know that I always quote it and do that accent to my wife when I'm. I always say, I love you. <laughs> always have, always will. <laughs> I want to marry you. <laughs> um, but I don't, I mean, I, again, I have not seen this film in probably 10 years. Yeah, it's been a, quite a while for me, too, even though I have seen it like 20 or 30 times, probably. Mm-hmm. 
Um, but I remember enjoying it and it's kind of, it's kind of, even if it's, you know, not historically accurate or whatever, it does have a good plot to it. Oh, like yeah. it's, it's got some twists and turns and it's got some, you know, some things you're not really expecting in it and everything. And it's keeps your interest. Although, I mean, yeah, the, he's doing this whole thing because of his wife <laughs> dying and everything. And he becomes suddenly is like this badass that can go and lead the people and everything is, yeah, it's kind of hokey, but. It's, you know, gives you that, you know, that emotional charge. Yeah, let's kill those Brits. Yeah, you know? I mean, it's like an old timey payback. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it kind of is. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I think he's been in a lot of movies where he gets angry after a loved one is murdered. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, that w- uh, that uh, Lethal Weapon, they yeah. kill his girlfriend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ransom. That, that, yeah. Give me back my son. Yeah. yeah. It was, that was the whole, that was a Mel Gibson genre back yeah. then. Was, <laughs> angry. Uh, yeah, exactly. Revenge. <laughs> Let's go get them. They killed somebody I love. And well, that was like the whole 80s and 90s, really. St- Seagal and Van Damme <laughs> had that whole, that was their whole career as owed to that. <laughs> Do not be a family member. Yeah, uh, hold people. off, because we're going to talk about a Van Damme movie today that does not have his family getting killed. Oh, <laughs> so oh, that's a rare one. It just one. has a random little girl getting killed. Oh, uh, well, that's, that's well, that. that's that's the that's the reason right there. Um, 1995 was also the year of the Usual Suspects. Yeah, mm-hmm. which is such a fantastic oh, movie. It's amazing. It's uh, I think it's I mean, it still holds up really well today too. Yeah, I and, saw it a few weeks ago. It's solid. Yeah, yeah, so good. This was. Uh, Chris from Macquarie uh, teaming up with Brian Singer, who would become, you know, what, you know, Brian Singer, like, he, he's never really done a movie like this since. No. He's, he's had a decent career with X, the X Men and, you know, something here or there, producing House, mm. but he's never made a movie this good. No, this I don't was, think so. This was really interesting to read about, like, behind the scenes about, like, who Kaiser Soze really is because apparently like some people were kind of kept in the dark and uh, people were told different things about who ended up being Kaiser Soze because then Gabriel Byrne ended up yeah. playing the guy who shoots Gabriel Byrne. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then they flash back to it and everything. And then there's still some debate on whether actually Kevin Spacey was Kaiser Soze at the very end or whether it was Pete Postlewaite or that kind of thing. Yeah. Gab- yeah. Gabriel Byrne actually thought he was yeah. until he saw the movie. Yeah. <laughs> and then he, and he apparently got really pissed off about yeah, that. Yeah, I would too. Man. Yeah. And he came out and he's like, what's this? You know, I thought I was Kaiser Soze. But yeah, uh, it does have a somewhat ambiguous ending, I guess. You mm-hmm. could still say, yeah, it's Pete Postlewaite uh, at the end. And, and then there's, of course, there are a lot of the things that Spacey is seeing apparently in the background is impossible. Yeah. You know, it, I, I still like you. So we watch the end of that and it's like, yeah, OK, you couldn't have read that. Where you are. <laughs> what an ending, though. That's well, the one endings, of the best endings of all time. The ending, like just all my hairs were just standing up. Yeah. And in fact, my hairs were standing up when they first announced that Byrne was the guy, like in the bit that when he's like Keating is Kaiser so yeah, he's so I convincing. Was, I was like, I was like, Oh my God, uh, uh, that's an amazing thing. And then, and then, then, then they add that at the end. Yeah. It's like, Oh, it's, it's in my mind. but yeah, usual suspects is, uh, is, is one of the very best movies that you can possibly see. If you mm. like crime capers, I don't know that it gets much better than this. It's such a cast too. Oh, like, is like everybody is great. Benicio del Toro mm-hmm. in a huge breakout performance. Uh, Kevin Spacey in a breakout performance, and then you had people like Gabriel Byrne who had had a bit of a career, but nothing this big at this point. Uh, Kevin Pollock yeah. again, <laughs> who yeah. somehow pops in these big movies every yeah. once in a while. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, and you have Chaz Palm and Terry and. If you haven't seen it you've been spoiled but uh you should still see yeah it. still see it yeah it, it, even when you know it's great another uh 95 movie with a great cast is apollo 13 mm, yes uh, uh, and one of the things i like most about this movie i don't know if this is the right way to say it i like this movie's parts more than i like its whole mm. um but the parts are these great performances right you've got you know five or six big name actors who are all just playing their roles perfectly i think um you know you, tom hanks is huge not, not that these other people aren't big actors but they're all kind of you know right up there with him in this movie as far as i'm concerned like ed harris is super engaging mm. um i really like watching this movie it's one of those movies it's one of those first movies where i realized wow even when i know what's going to happen i can still be entertained yeah well, the, the ending of that is where you know they have everybody in the control room they're all looking at the screen expectantly there's a really great shot of 
all of them. Yeah. And it's mm-hmm. in the middle of that big suspenseful, like, is it going to come into the screen or not? And, and you, like you said, you know, it is. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's history. <laughs> yeah. But you're still going, Oh, maybe it won't. Yeah. So, and importantly, <laughs> they wait until the appropriate time to celebrate. Yes. Yeah. In fact, they yeah. do. So there's no more premature <laughs> celebration. Oh my God. Like in the Martian. Like in the Martian. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and uh, is this Ron Howard's best movie? Yes. Okay. I, I'm, I like how fast you said that, because I was thinking about this earlier, and I decided it was, but you didn't have any hesitation. No, Ron Howard ha- has made a lot of, like, good movies to this point, like, or or bad or middling type mm. movies. And even after this, he makes those type of movies after, like, you know, it's like Grinch, and yeah. uh, he made Splash before this. And Splash is good, but it's like, you know it's not great yeah. or by any means uh he made willow and he yeah. you know it, it's there's a lot of these and cocoon and <laughs> so it's one of those it, he's one of those directors he i don't think he gets close to this until he does cinderella man later on a movie that didn't do anything at the box right. office but uh that that's as close as he's gotten apollo 13 mm. since uh, but yeah, definitely his best. Yeah, I really like it. Yeah. What else, guys? Well, how about Toy Story? <laughs> yeah, number one <laughs> movie of 1995, as it turns that out. It was big. Yes, it was. And pretty deservedly, I think. Yeah. Um, I, I, This is one of those experiences that stuck in my brain. It was We were actually visiting here in Nashville from Illinois, where we were going to college, and it was cold as shit. Because this movie came out in what? Came like, out in the Christmas yeah, area. Yeah, and um, it was like 20 below, and we decided to go to a movie just to get warm, get out of the freaking car, and we picked Toy Story, and here's these, I think there were six of us, and we were between the ages of like 20 and 35, uh-huh. and we all came out grinning like <laughs> six-year-olds. <laughs> yeah. It, it's just a, it, it pleases, I think, every type of viewer. This was the first time we had seen this type of animated cartoon. It yeah. was 3D computer-generated uh where in the middle of where Disney has, uh, they've experienced a resurgence in hand-drawn animation. Mm-hmm. Weird timing for yeah. them because <laughs> they they had just come out with The Lion King the previous year. They came out with Pocahontas this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, that wasn't a great movie, but, like, it seemed like they, they, they were back with hand-drawn animation. This Toy Story comes in. It's number one movie of the year, and it it completely changes the way they look at animation at this point. They say hand-drawn can't be done anymore because everybody wants computer animation. After a few years of this, uh, it changed the landscape completely. Now, the reason why the hand-drawn wasn't doing well is because those movies sucked. It wasn't <laughs> anything, anything to do with the hand-drawn nature of it. But Speaking of Pocahontas, I took my girlfriend at the time to that movie, and on the way in, she said the name Pocahontas. And I... <laughs> I said, Poker Hannes, I barely even know her. And <laughs> I didn't get in trouble for making the joke. I got in trouble for laughing through the first half of the movie at my own joke. I could not stop giggling at how stupid and funny that was to me. And that's almost literally everything I remember about that movie. Yeah, I don't remember much about it either, other than the fact that they made Pocahontas like this six foot model. They did, basically, they sure did. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, there's the scene where John Smith, uh, who's Mel Gibson again, yeah, uh, you know, first encounters Pocahontas, and it's like all this wind blowing <laughs> through the wind. She looks like Beyonce. She, yeah, she looks like Beyonce, <laughs> and there's like I guess a waterfall behind her or something like that, and it's like like oh yeah, it's about to get some real Pocahontas up in here. It's you know? still better. Than than the one later in a new world where she looks 12 years old yeah and yeah, just like, yeah no colin farrell <laughs> yeah, back away yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah toy story is uh is, is is just a really good movie like you couldn't have you know to have a, a basically new medium and and thrust that on the american you know, on an audience they knocked it out of the park they could have come out with something you know, subpar, and what would have happened if that was if that was the case? Right. Well, it helps to have Tom Hanks. I mean, what a year for that guy! Yeah, Tim another Allen. year. Yeah, you know. Yeah, well, again, this is like a third or fourth year in a row. Tom Hanks is you know hitting grand slams. Yeah, I want to talk about uh, Clueless. Okay, ah, yeah. yeah. This movie was for that time what Fast Times at Ridgemont High was for its time. Same director, right? Huge movie. Mm-hmm. Everyone in my college saw this movie. It's still pretty funny today. I haven't oh, yeah. seen it in like six or seven years. Uh, but Paul Rudd yeah. mm-hmm. is in this movie, and he's not two years old, <laughs> which you would expect looking at him today. Right. Um, 
because he's the ageless wonder. Uh, he does look boyish in this movie. Yeah. But uh, it's amazing how he looks today, given that he was in this yeah. 20 years ago. Yeah. I freaking love Clueless, man. Mm-hmm. This is this is a very 90s movie, too. Incredibly 90s. Incredibly 90s. Uh, has a huge cast in it, though. A lot of these people went on to do other things. Alicia Silverstone was only known, really, for the Aerosmith video and yep. the crush. Yep uh before this and i thought she really knocked it out of the park in this and yeah. and uh, amy heckerling again who did fast times at ridgemont high uh reels this all in and it's i remember seeing when i was i was working at a movie theater and we got the standee for this thing and it's like it shows all three of the girls all in their like you know they got their bags and they get their makeup and all that and i was like what kind of bullshit movie is this <laughs> like that that is not a movie that a guy will be watching that is for sure and then i ended up watching it and i was like oh yeah this is funny this is a good movie it's transcendent because there's a lot of shit that dates it there's a lot of kind of reverse misogyny a little bit of uh anti-homosexuality and like kind of think donald Faison's character is kind of like yeah. pretty rough to, to his girlfriend <laughs> yeah but but the sentiment really holds true. I, I saw it not too long ago, and I, I was like, man, this is just a really good movie at its core. And even though it's kind of cloaked in all of this like lexicon and, and Southern California in the 90s and all that stuff, it's really good. Because I knew we were going to talk Clueless today. Instead of emailing you the story yesterday, I saved it. But yesterday, I was flipping channels. And whenever I see a movie on one of the pay channels that I've never heard of, I go to it and at least see that first screen of information to see what it might be about. And yesterday I saw this movie called Dysfunctional Friendships. And it said, 2012, college friends reunite after seven years, dot, dot, dot. Stacy Dash. Oh, nice. Uh-huh. The next name, Terrell Owens. What? what? <laughs> and I swear to God, I hovered over that more info button for like three minutes trying to make up my mind if I wanted to know more or less. Yeah. And I eventually just moved on. And uh, I don't know anything else about this movie, but Stacy Dash was included. Yeah. So that's and, not a recommendation. Well, and unfortunately, Stacy Dash, known for way more other yeah. stuff these days, but she's fantastic and clueless. Yeah, she oh, yeah, she's really good in it. Yeah, um, everybody, Brittany Murphy, who yeah. came on the scene in this, uh, is great in this, and they they really like try they really make you know her look like this tomboyish mm-hmm. you know type of girl and everything, and she's great in it as well. But love Clueless. That's a that's a good one. It's one of those that just came out of nowhere. And I remember some people around my circle who didn't like it. They just thought it was stupid or whatever. And I was like, okay, I guess. But man, there's some smart stuff in here. I don't know. You think you're shortchanging this movie mm-hmm. a little bit um what else guys well so how about the transformation of bond this year yeah pierce brosnan i I think pierce brosnan gets kind of a unfair shake as his uh his bond character because i think he's really good he's in a lot of silly bond movies well that's the problem he's great as bond but the movies all around him are ridiculous i mean bond movies in general are ridiculous but these that he's been in especially the later ones that he was in were just yeah putting in denise richards and all this other type of stuff in the later but uh but like yeah, this is it. Brosnan's always been, he was always good. Mm. They wanted him back in the early 80s, but yeah. he had to do Remington Steel. Yeah. And uh, they ended up with Timothy Dalton for a couple of uh, couple of bonds. But uh, when he, he came on, Goldeneye is the best of his. Yeah, um, absolutely. Of his group. I mean, everything else is, I think it just falls off the cliff. Well, it's right odd that. this movie is known more for its video game than its actual movie. Yeah. And with good reason, <laughs> yeah. because that game was awesome. It was. It was the first, like, four-player shoot, first-person shooter on Nintendo 64. Yeah, and you could, they have an emulator now. You're like, you can play that. I think you can get it on Steam. Uh, if you want to play it in HD, some fan, nice. group of fans built it from scratch in <laughs> HD. Um you know, I always I always wish in hindsight that we had gotten the serious kind of bond we get today with Pierce Brosnan as the character. Uh, I watched The Thomas Crown Affair the other day, mm-hmm. uh, which gives you huge Bond vibes, of course, mm-hmm. uh, and, and has plenty of fun, but is more serious in nature and tone. And that's what always turns I, – I can't rewatch any of these pieces these Pierce Brosnan bonds. There's no fun in it for me. Yeah. Um, I noticed when I was writing down some movies in 1995, there was a theme. See if you can guess on the theme, the quick and the dead, dead presidents, dead man, walking (laughs) dead man, (laughs) die hard with a vengeance. 
a lot of dead going on in 1995. There was much death. <laughs> yes. Um, Die Hard with a Vengeance was the first movie that I successfully built uh, nice. as a 35 millimeter print. Awesome. Um, I wanted to mention Die Hard with a Vengeance. First off, it's it's a it's a goofy Die Hard. It's mm-hmm. it's the last watchable die hard mm-hmm. <laughs> yes um and it's got you know it's got a good you know bruce willis and samuel L. jackson fresh off of pulp fiction even though they didn't have scenes together in that movie um are, are great are they're they're a great little team in this but die hard with a vengeance might be notable that it uh, discusses in brief two of our presidential candidates oh yeah there's one there's one moment in die hard with a vengeance where the the they decide to switch all the calls over to one call center and they're like yeah they're gonna switch it all to this one and the one lady's like and i'm gonna marry donald trump <laughs> <laughs> and then later on when they're trying to figure out who the 42nd president or the the chester uh-huh. a arthur uh-huh. one or whatever when they're trying to figure that out they're like what's the what's what's the 42nd president and he's like it's hillary clinton hillary uh-huh. clinton and they're like no that's she'll be the 43rd president <laughs> like because they were already talking about hillary clinton being president back in 1995 wow. that's funny. and uh but yeah both of those names pop up and that's Die Hard crazy vengeance took her a while what's she been doing yeah nothing <laughs> zero things um secretary of state like that requires work (laughs) (laughs) um we talked last week about pulp fiction and the way that when you walked out after that movie you were like i've never seen anything like that Mm -hmm. this year has a lot of those yes it does Mm -hmm. and one of the ones i'm looking at right here i saw the same week i saw toy story and that's 12 monkeys oh Oh, yeah um brad pitt unhinged um (laughs) in a good way bruce willis he's so engaging in this movie of course, time travel is a topic that's always going to fascinate me. Mm-hmm. Uh, great performances, intriguing plot. The way it unfolds is great. Um, plenty of questions, plenty of room for debate. I really love this movie. Yeah, this is Terry Gilliam doing yeah. a um, a movie that it's not. I mean, I don't. It's more straightforward actually than more than most Terry Gilliam, even though it's got a lot of craziness in it and everything. But a lot of the movies he had done before this, like Brazil and the Adventures of Baron Munchausen yeah. and all these other stuff, are more fantasy oriented movies. This is a more of a sci fi action thriller than well, not really action. I guess it's more. I don't know, more thriller, more mm. mystery mm. than anything. Uh, this was based on a French movie called La Jete, which is just a bunch of still images, basically. Uh, it doesn't have, I mean, 12 Monkeys is obviously completely different from that, but La Jete tells the same sort of kind of story where mm. it's going out into the, you know, it's it's got that same kind of vibe to it. But 12 Monkeys is, you know, it's actually moving pictures and everything. But 12, <laughs> Monkey, 12 Monkeys is so good. And Brad Pitt hates his hates this performance. He, wow. He got nominated for it. Famously cut his own hair, too. Yeah. But <laughs> he's, looks like it. Yeah, but he's so good at it. This is where you thought, this is where you, this is the year, actually, that you were like, Brad Pitt's more in a pretty face. Well, yeah. yeah, let's segue right to that then. Because another movie that I walked out of saying I've never seen anything like that is Seth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And this is to me Fincher like this is when he reached his peak talent. I'm not saying he's dropped because mm-hmm. I freaking love the social network. I like Girl with a Dragon Tattoo more than most people. I, th- I still think he's great, but this is his first great film in my opinion. Yeah. Um and the way that it's shot, the mood of this fucking thing and then, of course, the surprise cameo that in this day and age would never be a surprise. Nope. Uh, the internet would ruin it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but added to the enjoyment of the film. And then the way this movie ends uh, in a way that 99.9% of movies are too chicken shit to ever end. Yeah. Um, I've never seen anything like it. I'm not sure I've seen much like it since. What are yeah. the odds that as a movie actor that you get involved in two of the greatest reveals of all time? Yeah. In the same year. Yeah. yeah. Seriously. Well, Kevin Spacey's got to be loving it. And that's that's why when I watched Usual Suspects the first time and enjoyed that so much and then watched Seven after that, it's almost a continuation of that character. Uh-huh. Like it's, you, you can almost, it's almost, you know, it's like, even though they're not the same character, obviously, there's there's some sort of, you know, he's playing the bad guy in both both movies and He's always a step ahead and all that. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) No pun intended. (laughs) Yeah. When you watch them back to back, there's a there's an interesting dynamic to it and everything. But uh, yeah, this is uh, this is some sick, twisted shit. It's a horror movie uh, disguised as a thriller, a mystery thriller. (laughs) Yeah. 
Um, and it, yeah, it's so dreary. The the look of it, the yeah. the the music during it, and everything, basically just you know that mm-hmm. you know just kind of gets you in that. There's this isn't going to end well, is it? Well, <laughs> you know? and you know from the outset because the opening credits are like, and it's yeah. like a visual like cavalcade of imagery that's creepy yeah and you see like the writing and the fingernails and the blades and it's like sets the tone right out of the gate you're gonna see some twisted shit it yeah. looks like a nine inch nails video yeah, yeah. but it, well and funny enough well, he works with trent reznor well, now. and yeah. i believe there were some nine inch nails songs i think this. there were and david bowie who was who was sort of uh experimenting with that and the heart's filthy lesson shows up mm-hmm. in, in the credits the end credits which go upside down or or go right or or they come down from the screen instead of mm. so the credits in this were just bonkers like this is the first time i'd ever seen cr- opening credits like this yeah. and then ending credits like this but uh but yeah this movie's so like yeah man it's so good <laughs> yeah. it's so good <laughs> yeah uh don't be surprised if it's in my top three or four yep also coming out in 1995 was heat yeah uh, michael mann's three hour doesn't feel like it although i guess there are parts that it feel sure like does it does whenever al pacino's at home yeah al pacino <laughs> at home uh any scene with de niro and brenneman in it where yeah. he's where they're just talking about the relationship and they're on balconies <laughs> and stuff uh <laughs> they are always on balconies yeah, they are, they're on balconies throughout this movie yeah uh aside from that though heat is just ridiculously great like heist action thriller movie that even though there are some slow moments in it, it does feel like it moves a little bit faster once it gets to those action scenes mm-hmm. and everything. The bank robbery up leading up to the LA the the big shootout in LA, which is basically World War Three. Yeah. Um and and all the subsequent chasing after that I mean, that final hour of heat is up there with just about anything. Yeah, absolutely. Watch. Yeah. Um, and of course you you finally got the the meeting between Robert De Niro and Al Pacino on screen, which everybody had been waiting for, and they've redone a few times since, but not well. Certainly well, and that, that good. we didn't expect it to be so subdued. The co- conversation over yeah. coffee, but it's so great. I oh, love that yeah. scene so much. Oh yeah, but there are there are still some people out there who are like, yeah, they're on the they're uh, they're in the same scene, but there's a there's a lot of cutting there. There's not really a lot of them in the same shot. <laughs> And so, so like there was a lot of that going on. Like, yeah, it's that scene is incredible, mm. by the way. But they're right. You know, there's not a lot of like you know them together in one shot. In that, uh, they yeah they would eventually go into Righteous Kill, yeah. which is one of the worst movies you'll ever see. <laughs> Good choice, if, guys. If, if there was ever a, a moment, if there was ever a, a, a moment where we're trying to dissuade you from watching a movie which will make you want to watch the movie probably don't watch righteous kill such a terrible movie but uh but heat is just you know it's one of those movies that just you know talk about and there's another huge cast in yeah. this just a tremendous cast val it. kilmer val kilmer yeah tom sizemore mm-hmm. um and just many many others but uh I love this movie. You can, you can. It's another one you can pop in anytime. It's good. Mm-hmm. Local Nashville and Ashley Judd is in that movie. Yes, she is. Ashley Judd, who I saw at the soda fountain at the theater that one time. <laughs> yes, she was also just as a minor movie. The a movie Smoke came out this yeah. year. She was in that too, and uh, Smoke was really good. Yeah. By the way, I don't. We don't want to have to discuss it very long, but. But uh, another good movie. It was funny, though. One of the few times that I did actually talk to Ashley Judd, this came out of my mouth. I liked seeing you in Heat and Smoke. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Heat and Smoke. That'll, that'll break the ice. Yeah, well. <laughs> well, um, uh, another big cop uh, action movie that goes the other direction from this year was Bad Boys. Yeah, yeah. Will Smith <laughs> and Martin Lawrence. Are you guys laughing at me? I'm laughing at Bad Boys. It, oh. it goes in the opposite direction, that's for sure. Well, yeah, okay. Uh, and Now they've just announced that in 2018, we're going to get Bad Boys 3. Well, yeah, and they they were, it was going to be a summer movie, I think, for 2017. They moved it to January of 2018, Interesting. which means probably not going to be very good. Well, it's also not Michael Bay this time. It's Joe Carnahan. Oh, really? The guy who did, that's the guy that did A-Team and in the Grand. NARC. Yeah. Um, and he's already talking about they want to make this the best one ever, whatever. Mm. Are, these are popcorn throwaway movies, but uh, I th- I find Bad Boys really watchable despite what I see as flaws throughout. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's at a time where Martin Lawrence was still funny. Yeah. And I don't know that he still is. I don't 
pay that much attention to what he's doing these days, but I love him pretending to be what he sees Will Smith's character as. <laughs> yeah. The way he talks, I'm like, wow, right? And he's trying to finish witness. And I still, anytime I trip in the house, I still quote, Martin Lawrence tripping in Will Smith's apartment, which he's pretending is his. So out loud after he trips, he's like, why am I tripping over shit I know is there? (laughs) (laughs) Which is one of the stupidest things to say. Um, And this movie's preposterous, but everybody's having a good time. Joey Pants is having a good time. Um, I I find it really enjoyable. I don't know about you guys. Yeah, Will Smith is a little bit out of character of his like real clean cut image and everything. Sure. And it's, you know, it's fun to watch. Okay. I mean, this is. Uh, I think both of them are kind of fun to watch. Yeah, actually, yeah. this is just before he's hitting superstardom as an actor. It, it'll take until the next year to do that, but uh, he's still, I think, mostly known as the Fresh Prince, and well, and and Fresh Prince of Bel Air and all mm-hmm. that um, at this point. Um, but this sort of this sort of put him in front of a mass audience for the first time. He'd done, you know, six degrees of separation and made in America and all these movies before that. But this was the first like big, and it was also the first big Michael Bay movie. Mm. Uh, Michael Bay's career gets started with this as well. He was a music video director before this. And, he, and it still holds up as one of the most Michael bay movies that he ever made, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, explosions out the ass, all the orange tinting and the glamour highway yeah. shots and the pulse pounding dunk 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 like mm, soundtrack yeah. and, and he is very michael bay here on his first one out yeah so yeah that's a that's a that's a decent i could i would even put it in your guilty pleasures almost <laughs> uh but uh but no it's, it's, it's got enough from 1995 that's there, right it's pretty it's pretty solid though um also in 1995, uh, Crimson Tide. Yeah. Mm. Another good uh, submarine movie to compliment your hunt for an October. You know, if you ever want to like watch those back to back. Yeah, that'd be good. That's yeah. a good double feature. Yeah. This is notable for Denzel Washington I and love Gene Hackman. Yeah. yeah. You want to talk about yelling at each other. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is so good. Like when it gets to them yelling at each other, it's like, this is what I paid my ticket to see right here. You know, um, young and old, white versus black, you know, that type of thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a good what if, like what if all your communications went down? What if uh, there was a message that was halfway there that was in you're on the brink of nuclear war? What? What do you do? Do you do you wait for the order? Do you do you just blow away Russia? <laughs> what do you do? You know, <laughs> and uh, and and it's like you know, it's the battle between these two sides. One one's an old school guy, one's a new school guy, and and uh, man, that that's just that's a scene. <laughs> the, the I could watch that over and over again. Just, oh yeah, just oh, him yeah. and Hackman yelling at each other is just is just the best thing. And I love the lead up to it too, because Gene Hackman's like. Just, just shrugging it off the whole time. He doesn't want to talk about it. He's trying to avoid Denzel Washington this whole time. He's like, he's like, Mr. Hunter, we do not make decisions based on little devils or angels on our shoulders. You know, <laughs> something like that. You know, uh, yeah, man, this is it's just as good. And there's another huge cast here. You got Gandolfini's in it. Yeah. Vigo Morton, Mortensen. Ricky Schroeder dies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> or, no, he has no, to close the hatch. No, he has to close the, the hatch. Yeah, and he's upset about it. Well, that's uh, emotional. I get it. Yeah, yeah. Poor guy. I got a quick aside, but a question about. Denzel Washington. Mm-hmm. He's a great actor. He's magnetic. He's charismatic. But he's always Denzel, isn't he? In every um, role that he has. Can he really disappear into a role? In I, some, I think he has. I mean, in Malcolm X, he did, but he. It, it, yeah, I know what you stretch. mean. I know what you mean. Like, it, you know, it, it is sort of just he's so intense and he's so magnetic. But there's not anything where you would think, oh, he could just you could put a, a disguise on him or something, and he wouldn't, he would, yeah. you know, be completely different. You're always you know? going to know that it's a Denzel. He doesn't ever put on a new accent or a new or a new walk of any sort. Or, or play any, like a weak character, basically. Right. It's Never always somebody that's character. in charge. Always well, somebody that's angling for charge. Courage under fire. It yeah. will show you a different Denzel. Although yeah. that's a thing that is prevalent through a lot of from courage under fire on is he's does that alcoholic thing yeah like a ton of alcoholic denzel washington if you ever <laughs> equalizer flight <laughs> <all Alcoholic Denzel. laughs> you know there's a lot of that coming in that's that's his weakness you know it's like you see him in the car like you know spinning a top off a bottle you know <laughs> um this is also uh, uh this is one of my favorite trivia things crimson tide 
the quick and the dead and virtuosity ah, i'm glad you brought that up have the rotation of actors so crimson tide is gene hackman and denzel washington quick and the dead is gene hackman and russell crowe and virtuosity is russell crowe and denzel washington ah. you know i've never seen anything like that since there is one more in 1998 that's close but it ain't exactly this we'll talk about the quick and the dead because i know you and i both like it more than most people do yeah right? i know you really like it yeah the, i remember bringing this up to somebody and they're like what that sharon stone western no. yeah that's what i got from quick and the dead this is the sharon stone <laughs> part of it <laughs> not the russell crowe gene hackman lance henrickson all leonardo these DiCaprio. leo dicaprio <laughs> keith david i didn't get that out of the movie um i love this i think this is sam raimi just directing his balls off in this this is you know this is the director of dark man and evil dead doing a western and it's exactly what you would think yeah. from sam raimi on this and uh i just love how he he stages these gunfights that are in this in this thing uh the camera's always moving and zooming around the people's eyes yeah. and like you know doing all this crazy stuff and it really gets you into it but unfortunately sharon stone's in the movie and so <laughs> there's people who think it's a sharon stone movie and she is the main character but i think she's okay in it i don't think she needs to be anything more than she is yeah no and, I, don't, I don't think she drags it down at all yeah uh, yeah this was one of the very early dicaprio mm -hmm. performances and you knew he was he was it wasn't just a, a fluke that what's eating gilbert gray mm -hmm. uh, showed us and everything and um but yeah this is such a kinetic movie and i wholeheartedly uh you know endorse quick and the dead if you haven't yeah, seen it fun. yeah um another fun gene hackman performance i mean this is him playing on his unforgiven character yeah. basically mm. um and uh yeah just good stuff um this was a pretty good year for snl cast members yeah so we have billy madison mm -hmm. and we have tommy boy yeah uh -huh. and uh those are not flawless no <laughs> let's not pretend they are but those are both like totally watchable comedies that still make me laugh yeah uh and this is back when sandler being doing whatever he wanted was a good thing yeah and not like we have today well and what he wanted what he wanted to do back then was be goofy yeah. and just not be afraid to be goofy and throw in some gags that may not make sense but we're trying to make you laugh yeah. or whatever and uh, and that's one of the things that I think is overlooked about Billy Madison. That that movie got horrible reviews, obviously. Uh, you know, um, but uh, you know there are there are things in it that are that I think are brilliant about it, even though it's a dumb comedy. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, it's it's a, it's one of those movies that's hard to do, it's hard to tell people. There's some actually really good, well thought out things in this even though it's a dumb comedy yeah and that's what it is and tommy boy is the same way tommy nobody liked tommy boy the the critics hated it and um in a certain demographic though right in my demographic that movie killed oh though. yeah everybody was quoting it everybody loved um chris farley's performance and david spade is the perfect foil for him yeah um he's really just it's interesting his performance because he's the straight man that's not necessarily the straight man because mm -hmm. he's you know plenty comedic on his own and uh, their relationship man you, you can't you can't really like buy that and you see it all the time they just throw talented comedians together but their uh, chemistry was really awesome I love that part in the lake when the kids are calling him fat <laughs> and he slowly loses his cool you better pray to the god of skinny punks <laughs> 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 um, but yeah and, and this is another one of the many like Rob Lowe shows up in it out of nowhere yeah. you know like yeah this <laughs> In, in wayne's world and yeah. austin powers and all that but he's a great villain in it um it, but yeah those two are i, I would I, those are just fun comedies now i are there comedies like this today that i'm dismissing as much as critics dismissed billy madison and tommy boy am i have i gotten old to the point where those type of movies don't work well with me now i'm not sure i I like most comedies anyway, so... I mean, the the equivalent would be something like a Kristen Wiig, Melissa McCarthy uh, yeah, but they're combination, way, but uh, not really, They're right? way more quote-unquote cerebral, I guess, yeah. than those movies just were. Just slapstick, yeah. Even though it's not really cerebral, it's just, you know, they're just... I don't know, they don't act dumb for the sake of being dumb. Yeah. Or overly dumb. Um, 
What else, guys? Well, I just want the opportunity to properly pronounce this director's name now that we've been corrected on SoundCloud on a comment. Paul Verhoeven, Verhoeven. Uh, came out with Showgirls this Sorry, year. Sorry, I'm still going to say Verhoeven. Uh, Damn it, Chris. I'm saying Verhoeven. That's the way I've heard it all my life. <laughs> but it's fun to say Verhoeven. Verhoeven. <laughs> it, it's, it's fun to say it in this context. Yeah. <laughs> but if I'm just sitting around like talking to my buddies at the food court, I'm going to say, because <laughs> we talk about Paul <laughs> Verhoeven all the time. You're always at the food court. <laughs> That's right. Always at the food court um, next to the Cajun place. And we're just going to be like, Verhoeven. <laughs> All right. Well, Elizabeth, Showgirls. Elizabeth Berkeley, fresh off of her Saved by the Bell performance. Oh, yeah. Really breaking out in many different ways. Oh, my she God. She went for it, didn't she? Yeah. She went the hell for it, man. And what, what do you guys think? You guys did a uh, a sin video on this. Oh, yeah. yeah. A deep dive into it. We did. Yeah. What are your thoughts this on it? This movie wants to think it's clever. Mm-hmm. This movie is trying to be a satire, a parody in, in some ways. It does not succeed. No, it doesn't. <laughs> Unlike the other Verhoevens yeah. <laughs> that uh, have been poor, like have been dismissed uh, upon their arrival and then found an audience later. This one, I feel, has more of that modern day ironic audience that enjoys movies like this. It it's it's a it, it is now a popular movie i think due to the i guess i'm going to quote ifc crowd basically mm-hmm. you know, like <laughs> if, if you ever watch a bunch of ifc you know they like to they like to pump up these bad movies yeah. as something that you should give a second chance or whatever and uh but like it, it, this movie's just bad it's yeah. just a bad movie it's not <laughs> anything good about it the oh, acting is bad the script is bad really everything is bad yeah and uh, i understand you know you can watch this sort of like with that like in mind like okay it's horrible i'm gonna laugh at it mm. i this movie's hard to get through this for is, me i think one of the only movies i can remember that combined three things a sex scene a pool and a seizure <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and my my boner didn't like that no i when i when we send this and we saw this we saw this scene again it was like is he enjoying this is it possible to enjoy this like like they're in the water and she's like she's breaking his dick off right i remember thinking is this what she thinks sex is yeah like is she yeah. that sheltered yeah. like is this is what this, she thinks is this her first time yeah. <laughs> thrashing around like yeah. a fish out of water yeah and and yeah i, I guess uh, a, a great part of the appeal obviously is if you were a big saved by the bell fan to see her in this light was stunning and shocking she's all out there yeah she is um, but uh but no i i've never gotten this movie as more than it is it's not like starship troopers yeah where you come back and go you know what i really didn't give this movie a fair shake it's i gave it a fair shake <laughs> maybe in more than ways than one but um <laughs> but uh but yeah not good well, let's stay in Las Vegas for a moment and talk mm. about Nicolas Cage. Mm-hmm. Oh. Leaving Las Vegas. Yeah. I believe mm. he won the Oscar for this. He did. And um, I really dislike this movie. Oh, yeah. And I know really? that that's not a popular opinion. Mm. It's just depressing. Super depressing. It's supposed yeah. to be. I get it. Um, I don't enjoy being depressed by a movie mm. when there's basically zero point or lesson to be learned. Um, and I like Nicolas Cage. Mm-hmm. I like him more than most people. But I don't, how hard is it to just act progressively drunker throughout a movie? Yeah, I can see that. I don't know. I mean, he's got some incredible moments. Now, the the movie is so heavy. It's incredibly heavy. There's there's very little redemption in this movie at all. Right. But like the scene where he's just absolutely like he can't sign the check over and he's, you know, in in DTs and just a a total wreck. And then when he's in the liquor store, he's the happiest person he's ever been. You know, he's out there just like, man, I'll throw this in there and everything. And he's perfectly fine when he comes back, you know, and that's just I'm not super familiar with it, but that just seems to me like a very accurate picture of alcoholism and like how debilitating it can be. I, I recognize most people love this movie. Yeah, and okay. I I don't I don't think Jeremy is saying that that he is in it, he's obviously doing his job here. Yeah. But to want to watch that movie no, is yeah. is another thing. Like 
it, it's one of those it's one of those do you want do you want to be depressed while you watch a movie it's like most my of the life. time no <laughs> that michael <laughs> no. keaton movie my life yeah like, oh yeah it's like <laughs> that's heavy too. never again <laughs> fuck no, you, you. Saying, thanks for making me feel that yeah no you're just saying like how hard is it to act progressively drunk I mean, there are moments in that that i think he really carries the weight and it, it's strange we actually had a conversation a long time ago where we were trying to come up with the best actor of 1995 you remember that? oh yeah and we thought tom this. hanks had been nominated yeah exactly what well, it wasn't even nominated and uh yeah i mean i, th- I think this is a, a worthy award i think yeah, I'm not. I don't want to take bottom a lot of it. capital too. I guess I just didn't see what everybody else saw in it and uh, wanted to voice my gripe. Well, also the movie completely ruins Elizabeth Shue in my like my childhood <laughs> image of Elizabeth Shue. Yeah, <laughs> strips it all away. <laughs> I didn't like that either. Um, not, well, and I guess to somewhat stay on the dour note, Kids came out in uh-huh. 1995. Um. Another big, huge cast of young actors who became something later, like Chloe Sevigny and Rosario Dawson. Yep. Um, this is a this is another depressing movie. I mean, it it goes it's a sort of a, a night of all these kids, but it sort of turns into a will will the girl who has AIDS be able to stop the guy who ha- who gave her AIDS? <laughs> From having sex with the virgin. Yeah. You know, that's basically what this movie is. And ends the answer up. is no. <laughs> the answer is no, because it's <laughs> and we need to be there yeah. to prove that. Uh, and yeah. Uh, this is one of the most hard to watch, uncomfortable movies I've Very ever much so. seen. And if like it hadn't gotten some of that indie festival buzz, I probably wouldn't ever have gone to check it out. Yeah. I can't recommend it. But uh, this is a, a local writer, Harmony Kareen, who did this, mm. who wrote this, and then Larry Clark directed it. But um, but uh, Harmony Kareen would go on to do a whole bunch of like very oddball movies. Um, yeah. But but this is probably his best known, uh, even though he was just the screen screenwriter. Well, Spring Breakers, I guess. Well, Spring great. Breakers, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, At the time, certainly. Right. So I'll make it a little more, uh, add some levity here, and talk about Get Shorty. Yeah. Let's get him. I love Get Shorty. If you had just, we just watched Travolta rise from the ashes with Pulp Fiction. Mm -hmm. And then his first choice after that is Get Shorty. And at that point in time, I think we all believed he's never coming back down. He's (laughs) going to be on top forever. Uh huh. Because Get Shorty is just a solid fucking film. This is Sonnenfeld, right? Yep. Who does the Men in Black uh, in a couple years from now. Yeah. And he had just done Adam's Family and Adam's Family Values, and then he did this. And Gene Hackman. Who's yeah. having a good year? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This guy Hackman. right here, Gene Hackman. And playing a very different Gandolfini character, Gandolfini again. Yeah, Gandolfini's also having a um, good year. Yeah, this is, uh, this is really good stuff. This is Elmore, based off an Elmore Leonard, who Out of Sight, would we'd later see Out of Sight uh, based on his work and everything. Um, but this is such a fun movie. You're talking about, you know, when you are watching movies that are about making movies and also you throw a little bit of gangster uh, yeah. genre in there too. Dennis Farina so good yeah. in this. <laughs> they say the fucking smog is why you have such fucking beautiful fucking sunsets. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but yeah, the, everybody's having a ball in this Delroy Lindo. And I love this whole thing. Like there's this bag in an airport locker that, everybody knows the fbi is watching (laughs) and like and like there's all these great entertaining scenes involving people like considering whether or not they should open the locker (laughs) and everything but uh i love this just because yeah you you have chili palmer who is doing he's basically doing two jobs in this he's trying to recover this money that was stolen but he's also trying to pitch a movie based on this story that he's in to Gene Hackman, who's a low rent, like C list yeah. producer. Oh, it's so he's good. always angling with one <laughs> with one thing or another. Like, he's like, eh, all right, I, I, this is how I can use that. <laughs> yeah, and he's got these classic lines like, uh, "This is where the Cadillac of minivans came <laughs> from." Where he gets he gets the wrong, he gets a minivan at the uh, at the car rental thing, and you know you can open the doors remotely. And he's like, "Yeah," and and by the end of it, he's you know he's disappointed at the beginning, but by the end of it, he's like. 
hey, check this out, man. It's a Cadillac and minivans. And then everybody's <laughs> driving them at the end. It was like, you know, just the delusional Gene Hackman, you know, talking about like, you know, this was going to be one of my, my pet projects. It was going to be my driving Miss Daisy, you know, and all that. <laughs> like, he's this guy who does these swamp creature movies and stuff like that. But, uh, and Rene Russo's in it. Yeah. Great, great in this. Danny DeVito. Yeah, Danny DeVito. Dan- the funny thing about Danny DeVito in this is he is obviously playing like most of hollywood here most of most hollywood actors but i love it every time they go to like an airport or something like that every magazine's got his face (laughs) on it yeah and it's got some story about him you know and like he's even got the his name's martin weir he's got a book out called weir details (laughs) (laughs) well they have those billboards of him and napoleon or whatever (laughs) yeah 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 <laughs> and it's like always these serious, these real self serious looks, and like you know, and he and and like yeah, this this you know, like he uh, calls a meeting, a lunch meeting at this place, this like this like you know where you get to be seen, uh-huh. you know, by by people driving down Sunset Boulevard or whatever. He calls this lunch meeting. They orders a whole bunch of stuff and then leaves <laughs> before he <laughs> shows yeah. up. And he orders off menu. Yeah, <laughs> orders off menu. <laughs> on, yeah. Yeah. So, and you just bring us a plate of strawberries to pick out. Yeah. <laughs> I just <laughs> I just love that that moment between Travolta and DeVito where he's just like, Look at me. Look at me, Martin. Look at me the way that I'm looking at you. And he goes back and forth and then he's like, You got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Yeah, this is so enjoyable. And of course, they, they tried to ruin all that with be cool mm-hmm. later. Um, but, uh, but man, this is, this is one of those big recommends out of a podcast. If you haven't seen Get Shorty, so entertaining and good. I'm going to stay on the humor side. And you guys are such big Woody Allen fans. Um, Mighty Aphrodite is one of my favorite Woody Allen really? movies Absolutely. ever. Yeah, that's I'm great. I'm glad to hear you agree. Yeah. Um, I every time they cut back to that Greek chorus and the masks and the shit that they say, <laughs> and of course her performance in the lead role is fantastic. I, I really like it a lot. Bullets Over Broadway is right up there with this one for me. And you guys love the classic Woody Allen stuff mm-hmm. more than I do. Uh, I don't think any of us love the super modern Woody Allen stuff, but no, this one's yeah. right in my wheelhouse. This uh, I don't remember if it was Bullets Over Broadway R rated. I don't know. Mighty Aphrodite was, yeah. and it was one of his first R-rated movies, I think. Uh, he had not done that uh, until this decade, I don't think. But uh, but Mira Sorvino is really good. I yeah. think she won the Oscar I for this. Um, but, uh, but yeah, this is an enjoyable movie. I'm just surprised that it's one of your favorites. Well, and it's just that it's, I think this is the era that I really loved what he was doing Mm -hmm. and uh, the seventies and eighties stuff doesn't hit me the same as it does you guys, but, uh, I really liked it a lot. He's got a sweet spot where he's not too old to make it not believable and he's not too young to where it, you know, he's almost like going for too much and, and it, it's really nice. I, I remember the scene where he walks into her apartment. There's just this random dildo sitting on the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay. You know. <laughs> uh, no, she's great. And he, they're playing off of each other is really good. Well, and now he's gone ahead and cast Jesse Eisenberg as a younger him yep. in his latest movie. So maybe he's going to stop giving us those 70-year gap relationships. I don't know. He's tried it before with Kenneth Branagh. He's tried it before with Jason Biggs. He's, yeah. You know, I mean, there's there's been a lot of proxies. Speaking of Owen Kenneth Wilson. Branagh, have you ever seen uh, Othello that came out this year? Yeah. With him and Louis yeah, I did. A yeah. lot. I haven't seen it in since then this but. may be the best kenneth Branagh i've ever seen yeah like, he eats up the role of iago yeah. uh so much and fishburn's good in it i think the it's a very good it's one of his better shakespeare films i think mm-hmm. uh but just from an acting perspective uh i remember being struck by how great he was really engaging yeah i mean is it the year after that he does hamlet yeah, I think it's yeah. Theory. So yeah. he's really in his groove i mean he's because he's great in that too yeah he is and yeah he's i, I love that performance yeah uh, also in 1995, Sense and Sensibility came out. Yeah. Uh, Speaking of Kenneth Branagh, let's segue into Emma Thompson. Yeah, Emma Thompson, <laughs> who wrote the screenplay based on the Jane Austen novel, and uh, Ang Lee directed this after, I think this was after Eat, Drink, Man, Woman, or whatever it was that he had sort of uh, thrust himself into the spotlight with. Um, but uh, Sense and Sensibility is surprisingly one of my favorite movies of 1995 it's just so well done it is the perfect drama 
Um, and, uh, and it, and it's all what the, the ending of it always has choked me up at the end because of just the way they, they, they do that at the end. Uh, but, uh, Emma Thompson's great. This is a, this is like Kate Winslet, like here I am moment. Basically she had, she had had a couple of movies before this, including, uh, heavenly creatures, I think had yeah. come out before this. Um, but, uh, but she got nominated for an Oscar for this and she's like 19 years old or something like this in this movie. Hugh Grant coming from Hugh the Grant. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And um, our, bo- our boy, uh, Alan Rickman. Alan Rickman, uh-huh. who, who, uh, uh, pretty much steals it with his character, you know, the Colonel Brandon character in this. He's just, uh, he's, he's both sad and hopeful. Uh, his performance brings that out too. Um, but, uh, I love that movie. Um, what else, guys? Jeremy, you want to talk about Waterworld? Um, well, it's definitely on my notable, but not great list. <laughs> I thought you liked that movie. I love it. Do you really? <laughs> yeah. I love the shit out of it. It's just not good. Uh, I can acknowledge that. Um, I saw that movie in the theater seven times. It ruled. Yeah. And <laughs> it's one of my favorite, uh, opening logo tweaks where they show you the universal logo uh-huh. and then the, the water slowly floods out all of the <laughs> earth as we know it uh, before the logo's over um yeah i can't say go watch Waterworld; you're gonna <laughs> like it i just can say that i really do and uh, i went it's probably because i went with like 17 friends we sat on the front row we snuck in all these hostess cupcakes and twinkies and shit <laughs> and we were expecting bad because the, you'd al- we'd already read that he'd fired kevin williams or reynolds in the middle of shooting and taken over the Filming himself, and I think there's like three movies where he fires Kevin Reynolds. And oh takes yeah, over for he, yeah. Um, and so we were expecting a giant turd that costs a lot of money, and that's probably what it is. Uh, but I had so much fun that first time. I just feel that same energy every time I see it. Sort of the beginning of the end of Kevin Costner as the big draw uh, that he was in years previous to this. Um, he does make some good movies after this. Yep. So obviously, we're going to be talking about one next next week, but. Um, but as a bankable box office star, this was sort of the beginning of the end. This was his Gigli, basically, mm-hmm. where people just started associating his name with bad movies. And then the Postman came out. That didn't help either. Not at all. Um, so, uh, but yeah, Waterworld, I've, I, last time I saw it was in 1995. Wow. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't remember anything about it. I know Gene Triplehorn's in it. Yeah, well, you're not and Dennis wrong. Hopper. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and yeah. he has gills. Yeah, yeah, he so. does have gills. Muto. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it so much. 1995 also had To Die For. That yeah. was Gus yeah. Van Sant with directing Nicole Kidman, who finally, I think, with this movie, finally was not just Miss Tom Cruise with this movie. Like if, for a while, she was like either in a movie with him or. You know, she she didn't quite break out until to to die for, and this was also a big Joaquin Phoenix, uh, and it was and, based on a true story, I think. Well, teacher and a student, I'm sure it's happened. It's yeah. really good. Um, it is really good. Um, and w- this was sort of uh, Joaquin Phoenix and Casey Affleck, uh, sort of their their rise. Well, and too. it's probably at this point in time Gus Van Sant's biggest film in terms of notice. Right? Yeah, and Be- t- yeah, and and yeah, and then he'll blow it out the water in a couple of years. Hunting, yeah, yeah, but but yeah, this was his biggest movie then um uh 1995 also kicking and screaming noah bombach movie that One i my love favorite so movies much. of all time yeah so such good dialogue yep. that runs throughout this movie not the will ferrell kicking and screaming no and everybody that's listening should check this out it's it's a really good snapshot of that awkward period between uh college graduation and going out into the real world and it's focused on a, a group of uh three or four friends that uh, that really have their unique way of talking to each other and to other people, and uh, it's great. It's great. It's it's about letting go and moving on with your life, and definitely check it out. Um, also, 1995. I've mentioned this movie several times, but The Last Supper came out. This is yeah a, another fantastic. This has a huge cast in it. Like the the woman who directed this, Stacy Title, has not. I don't think she's made anything. She may have, she may have a couple of IMDb credits after this. And I think she has a movie coming out this year, some small horror movie. But um, does it start Terrell Owens? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a good question to answer. But uh, but the Last Supper is about a whole bunch of liberal, like twenty year olds living together who are like, we're tired of not doing anything in our lives. With you know, we're tired of being right 
quote unquote, yeah. and and not doing anything and not being able to do anything. So they invite people who have Republican values over to dinner and one by one start to kill them <laughs> and poison them, um, which is a, it's a great movie if you can find it. I was trying to find it the other day and it's hard to find. Oh, really? Um, 1995, Higher Learning also Ooh, came out. Yep. John Singleton, you told the story about Higher Learning. Yeah. Um, but this was, this is not John Singleton's best movie by any means, but it's, it's a engaging movie. Big ass cast. Yes. Big ass cast. Holy crap. Yes. Um, I enjoy watching it. I don't think it's great, but it's watchable. F- Fishburne's accent is just, it's really unbearable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Richard Linkletter comes out with Before Sunrise, one yeah. of my favorite movies. So I good. love Before Sunrise. Um, if you want to just. It, this is another one of those night movies to me like one of those you pop it in at 11 o'clock midnight somewhere around there pop this in and just go into a dreamlike state watching ethan hawk and julie delpy until sunrise forth, until sunrise <laughs> and uh but uh such a good movie yeah it really is this is finally the year someone convinces johnny depp to do a normal leading man role mm-hmm. with nick of time <laughs> yeah. uh, have you ever yeah. seen this movie? I thought I you were going to say Dead Man. <laughs> oh, well, Dead Man is not a normal <laughs> no, leading man not. role at <laughs> all. Uh, and a weird-ass movie that, while I watched it, I'm not going to recommend. Uh, uh, it's good. But, well, the, but no, Nick of Time is awesome, too. Well, it's got the conceit of being a real-time film, yeah. mm-hmm. right? So that you're supposedly watching everything unfold in the same amount of time as you're sitting there in the theater. Um, and I actually like it more than I think most people do. I don't think it's great. He does a fine job. Mm-hmm. I think he proved I can do normal leading man shit. Now I'm going to go back to the weird stuff. Yeah. Uh, it's maybe not super memorable. It's one of those convoluted. He has to, they kidnap his kids so that he, they can force him to like assassinate somebody. Like a senator. Yeah. yeah. Christopher um, Walken's good in it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I really enjoy it. So yeah, uh, this, that movie, nothing. That's all they advertised was sure. this is real time yeah. and everything. It was like the, that was the big deal well, about it. It's not 24's real time. Right. They fudge it left and right. It's pretty consistent yeah. throughout. Yeah. Um, cause they constantly show you clocks. Yeah. They do. They do. We should do a clock count on that movie. Yeah. For like a <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> um, this is Rob Reiner's last great, well, I don't know if you want to call it great, but it's his last very good movie anyway. The American President came mm-hmm. out. Uh, this mm-hmm. is a, another so good. another team up with Aaron Sorkin, and this is sort of what led to West Wing. Uh, but yeah, love this movie. Michael Douglas and Martin Sheen and Annette Benning. One of my favorite Michael J. Fox roles ever. <laughs> yeah. He's playing sort of what would be, go on to be like a Rob Lowe or Bradley Whitford character to this president. He's like an advisor, but he has that one great scene. Oh, where yeah. Trying to get votes for this bill that the president wants to pass. First girlfriend, I think. Um, and this guy, the senator, tells Michael J. Fox no, and he just goes off. And when he hangs up, he goes, this guy's a no. And uh, <laughs> the boss, I think it's David Pamer, says, yeah. well, I should hope so. Because if that was a yes, we need to work on our people skills. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, yeah and then he has a great like confrontation with the president yeah. Yeah. Uh, after that. Uh, but yeah, American president's really good. Babe came out. This sort of uh, yep. set the standard on talking animal effects. Mm-hmm. Completely overshadowing Gordy, the other talking yeah. animal that <laughs> yep. came out this year. That's correct. <laughs> Um, also Sabrina, we've talked about that. Jeremy hates it. I love it. Oh yeah. And I would be remiss not to talk about embrace of the vampire. Alyssa Milano, <laughs> soft core vampire flick. <laughs> what is it with these TV sitcom actresses going naked? This I year? know it's uh, so weird, right? Like 1995 time to show the boobs. I remember, I remember in college, like I went, I was in my dorm and I was walking down the hallway and the guy, Two two doors down had like a whole bunch of dudes in his room <laughs> watching Embrace <laughs> of the Vampire. <laughs> I just it was one of those where you walk past something and then you back up and you're like stick your head in. You're like, hey guys, <laughs> watching Embrace of the Vampire. I see. <laughs> That's 1995. Uh, I think we're ready to vote. Yeah, and don't please don't come on the comments and say like, "What about Tank Girl?" or you know, all the, all of the movies we didn't name. Yeah, we because can't if name we them name all. all the movies. Then in about ten years worth of episodes, we're gonna be four hours long. Yeah, and Tank Girl's not that great. Yeah. So we, our, our purpose is to name all the great ones and maybe a few of the middling ones and. 
and you know maybe a few of the bad ones for their notable badness but mm -hmm. not to go oh yeah tank girl yeah okay it's good. not comprehensive <laughs> yeah exactly so anyway what's our voting today our voting order is chris barrett and jeremy Ooh. Oh, uh, man, this is so hard. Yeah. I predict multiple rounds. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, okay. <laughs> for, for, for pure artistry, mood, performances, um, and a knockout ending, I'm going to go seven. Wow. Good oh, call. wow. Hard to argue. Yeah, seven is... A, is well, he, I hate saying very unique because unique is should be enough. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's such a unique movie and, uh, it, you know, sort of, uh, keeps you guessing what's going on. And the ending is just a knockout and, uh, uh, just beautiful scenery, beautiful music, great performances. That's why it's going to win my vote. It's interesting that you said for performances and mood and knockout ending and everything, because I thought you were going to go with my pick, The Usual Suspects, yeah. uh, because it could apply to the exact well, same thing. Well, and that's thing. what I was thinking while I was saying, this could, this applies to The Usual Suspects, too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I can't get enough of this movie. Mm -hmm. I, I, no matter how many times you watch it, you can still get chills at that ending. And you can't underestimate Kevin Spacey's performance in this. You can't really underestimate anybody's performance in this. Everybody's great. And they all work together beautifully and they all stand out equally. So that's my pick. Good pick. Good pick. I'm going to go Gordy. <laughs> um, I, I have seven movies on this list that I would feel totally, I'd sleep well tonight naming yeah. any of these. There are two at the top that I, I think are dead even. I wrestled with this last night a lot. But I picked one, and I'm going to keep that, keep my word, and I chose the usual suspects. Yeah. Ah, yay! And just for the record, seven was the other one. Well, and it was going to be usual suspects, because I would have said usual suspects on my second pick. Yeah. You guys would have said seven, probably, on the second mm. pick. It would have been usual suspects. And it basically would have been a tie, too. I mean, usual suspects and seven. Watch them both. Yeah. yeah. Seriously, why not both? <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, I'm okay with that. Usual suspects winning. That's a fantastic movie. It really yeah. is. If you haven't ever seen it, uh, please treat your, treat yourself. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, uh, hopefully we didn't, we weren't the ones who spoiled it for you, but uh, surely you've heard this. By yeah, I it's 21 years old. My God. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah. I'm good with it. Sweet. Um, anyway, uh, now we're going to be talking about guilty pleasures. Guilty as charged. These are my confessions. You're so bad. Whatever. I'll do what I want. Now, our friend Jonathan claims that there is no such thing as guilty pleasures. Ah. It's that you like what you like and, you know, you don't have to apologize for it. Uh, but I think it does have a real definition. It's one in which most people don't like it. And you go amongst your friends and you say, I like this movie and they point and laugh at you. Yes. Um, and you can't defend it in front of anybody. You, there's nobody that's there to help you. <laughs> um, so we're going to be talking about those type of movies today. Critically not well received and generally the public didn't like it either, but you love them. Yeah. So uh, Barrett, you want to start us off? Sure. Uh, I'm going to start off with one. It actually has a higher score on Rotten Tomatoes than I thought it did. It has a 67% uh, fresh rating. And, which is weird because I don't think anybody would say that this movie is critically acclaimed, and it's The Devil's Advocate. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And, it, and it's a movie that I've wanted to talk about since we started this because I love it so much, and it's not good. It's not good, people. Um, it's got your boy Canoe in it there. It has got my boy Canoe, and I could not love him more in this role. Awesome. Oh, he yeah. is absolutely perfect for it. So, And I, I don't have to go into the whole thing, but long story short, Al Pacino's the devil. Yeah. Canoe is his son. Mm -hmm. And he's a lawyer. They're all lawyers. And it basically Because ends, get it? Yeah. The devil's a lawyer. Yeah. It basically ends with the most absurd monologue I've ever seen ever. in my entire life. Uh, where Pacino is proselytizing to, to Keanu Reeves uh, <laughs> in front of this big Boz relief uh, that's like kind of, you know, moving with like a big like orgy behind him and everything. And it's so over the top. This whole movie is such like ham handed biblical references. His fucking character is named John Milton. Yeah. 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 The, the writer of Paradise Lost and like everything is just over the top, but I love it. 
It's it's great. Well, it starts the trend that the uh, astronaut's wife would pick up later of Charlize yeah. Theron having a lot of bullshit happen yeah. to her. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, like she's like one, a, one of the more put upon wives in all of cinema history. This and, movie does not like women. Well, no. it doesn't, and especially doesn't like her. No. <laughs> like it basically breaks her down completely. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I also know this movie for having one of the weirdest sex scenes ever, where yep. it keeps changing between the <laughs> mm-hmm. curly redhead girl. Uh-huh. I think we used it in an outtake. We did. Well, we tried to, but it didn't come out right. But uh, that uh, that that actress is uh, what is her name? Connie uh, Connie Nielsen. Nielsen. But yeah, this is this was I, I had you know I'd seen Two Days in the Valley, and that's my introduction to Charlie Theron, but. Um, she's kind of playing sort of, a, uh, I don't know if she's playing the total airhead in two days in the Valley, but this movie is what really made me believe Charlie Theron is more than just a pretty face yeah. too. She's yeah. really, I mean, even though she's, everything is horrible that happens <laughs> to l- her. At least she keeps her accent the whole <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is one of the, one of the movies that led me, led me to, love her as an actress more than any i mean i i didn't realize i was going to love charlie theron so much <laughs> after the first few movies but man she's so good in this yeah but yeah this is hammy man this is the this is super hammy al pacino has gone off the rails in this and it's perfect for this <laughs> Maybe movie he's been doing some rails <laughs> yeah 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 he's, he's up there laughing his sick fucking ass off you know well if you get anywhere if it's on any of the movie channels and you get anywhere near the end don't change it because you need to watch this entire thing you don't even have to watch the entire movie but you definitely have to watch this last scene it is so terrific i mean it's 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 like Pacino said, give me the craziest thing you got. Yeah. I'm going to make it crazier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And here we fucking go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I am actually in the same boat. It's it's not a great movie, but it's fascinating to watch. <laughs> and 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 it's and it's great. And it's not I don't even know if it's an ironic sort of great. It's just what do you call this? Like, it's. It's almost like a like a Verhoeven movie. Yeah, Verhoeven. <laughs> yes, Verhoeven. It's intentionally over the top. I, you cannot imagine, and God bless him. I'm sure he's a wonderful guy, but you cannot imagine the acting disparity between Keanu Reeves oh and God. Al Pacino in the same scene. It's like playing basketball with your like six year old nephew or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah. But like Pacino's trying to play to the competition. Yeah. Like he's playing down to the competition. Basically. I win. That's my job. That's what I do. I win. It's cans. It's just cans. Oh my God. And it, this drives me crazy. And anybody that's listened to this for a while knows that accents really drive me crazy. Just, just pick it and go with it. Yeah. Like Elizabeth Olsen and, and uh, the Avengers and everything. Like just pick it. If you're going to go with it, even if it's ludicrous, like Mel Gibson, whatever he did, he went with it. And Kevin Lomax or Keanu Reeves <laughs> coming here just starts off real southern <laughs> and just by the end of it i mean come on man. Yeah. yeah it's all gone yeah anyway um, that's my pick good pick all right well i happen to choose all three movies that i listed as possible answers for this question from 1995 <laughs> uh because as i was going through making up this list i realized how many of them i really liked and i'm going to start with last week we talked about time cop the best jean-claude van damme movie <laughs> ever. this week i'd like to talk about the second best jean-claude van damme movie ever sudden death yes uh. and i would like to tell you why sudden death is awesome <laughs> for starters a hockey game game seven of the stanley cup finals yes. is front and center for the entire movie and i like seeing hockey get some love even if it's the pittsburgh penguins <laughs> second he's not a cop he's not an army ranger He's a fire investigator. (laughs) That is who's doing all this ass kicking. All right. More. Powers Booth has never chewed scenery up more than he does in this movie. Yeah. Five. Am I on five? Yes. I didn't count. He beats up the Pittsburgh Penguins logo character in the suit. It's actually a bad guy, a terrorist, but he has a fight scene in a kitchen with the Pittsburgh Penguins mascot oh and it's glorious <laughs> and it's amazing and I'm, I'm not done yet because by the end of the movie he's in goal he's playing goalie he blocks a shot and starts a fight to extend the game because if he doesn't extend the game everyone dies he's in a goalie costume oh I fucking love this movie I could watch it anytime and I don't think it's good but I love it I love the shit out of it it's 
made a strong case. Well, it's going to come out of this probably the one movie that you're going to get tweeted about the most is Sudden <laughs> Death because it is ridiculous like that. So ridiculous. Um, I don't remember much about I do remember the penguin fight, though. <laughs> I, did, I did see this. But man, this is, uh, yeah, it's, it's almost like, you know, with the, with Van Damme being the goalie, they took, they took that, uh, naked gun, Nathan, Leslie Nielsen being the umpire and all that <laughs> yeah. and, and made it serious yeah, quote unquote exactly, you know? exactly. <laughs> you know, so and this whole arena is rigged to blow with an explosion so big that the entire city would be wiped out and you want to know what the target is the vice president <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. that'll learn them yeah, yeah. yeah showed you <laughs> right i just took out the guy who i just took out your joe the Biden. guy behind the guy <laughs> um all right so one i know there's this this movie right here when it came out nobody liked it uh no critics loved it i think it's got 50 percent on rotten tomatoes uh 36 percent of rotten tomatoes users like it and it has a 5.8 on imdb and that's observe and report oh Oh, yeah great one um this is seth rogan basically doing a dark comedy version of taxi driver and if you watch it that way you might enjoy it but I think people were sort of used to Seth Rogen being a certain way, and it's too dark, possibly, especially since there's so many things in this where he goes way over the line. Mm-hmm. And this is not something that you can grasp onto as a hero, but there's a, a, a questionable sex scene with Anna Ferris where she's super drunk, and, and they basically had to insert a line where she's like, just go ahead and do it or whatever, even though, you know, the, you know, it's not the best. That's not still not the best circumstances under which <laughs> to uh, conduct yourself. But I love this movie so much because it does take that taxi driver thing, and it just it's just so comically fueled somehow and and it's got it's got great moments in it but it's just you know you take a guy who's this delusional about himself he wants to be a cop he's a mall cop this is the this was one of two mall cop movies that came out in the same year yeah. paul blart came out also but uh and i think paul blart came out first and it also hurt this movie as well but he's a mall cop and he wants to be a real cop and ray liotta is the cop that he kept constantly trying to appeal to to be this cop, Ray Liotta hates him and puts him through the ringer every chance that he can get, and uh, and you feel sorry for this guy, even though he is not, he w- should never be a cop. You should never <laughs> make this guy a cop, but you're rooting for him to be one, which is an odd trick to play when you're when you're playing a character this like this bad or yeah. whatever. But uh, you're still rooting for him to be a cop, even though Ray Liotta's absolutely right <laughs> with what he does to this guy. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, um, nobody, I couldn't find nobody who liked this. And there's a great scene with Aziz Ansari in here. Yeah, where he's, he's hilarious. Yeah, where he's like, uh, you know, <laughs> it's like, it's like you always accuse me of burning down the Chick-fil-A. Why would I burn down the Chick-fil-A? That shit is delicious. <laughs> 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 and, but yeah, man, this is uh, this is just uh, for me. It's just super enjoyable and fun, and I, I think it got some short shrift. I agree. So he, another one that I was actually a little bit surprised to discover that it was so low on Rotten Tomatoes with the audience and the critics is the Cable Guy. Yeah. Now all three of us love the Cable Guy. Yeah. Um, I think it's a brilliant performance, and I actually uh, really was hating myself because I didn't mention that in uh, last week when we were talking about the Jim Carrey performances and. This isn't a very traditional comedy. It's a dark comedy. It, oh, yeah. it, it came on the heels of that whole run of Ace Ventura's and The Mask and Dumb and Dumber. And it's another Ben Stiller uh, directed performance. Yeah. And man, it gets me on every level. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, Jim Carrey's performance is just this crazy obsessed. I guess it, it, it's, it's start to finish. It's great. It's supposed to be a satire. It's a very obvious satire. Some of the things still hold up today, um, and the quotes are just terrific. The soundtrack was awesome. Matthew Broderick is just completely adorable in this movie, mm-hmm. and you know, just go watch it. Go watch it. Um, I don't have to defend it much to our close friends because we all pretty much like it. What I've seen a lot on SoundCloud actually is that people are saying like, "What the cable guy? You can't talk me into that." I want to talk you into it because it's awesome. It is awesome. And my buddy in college, Josh, and I saw it in the theater. 
and it got such bad reviews when it hit the video store. We literally said, "All right, let's go find out if we were right or wrong." We went and rented it and brought it home, and we we're like, "We were right! It's awesome!" Yeah, that movie rules. I don't. I can't think of anything. It was funny is we almost got a much different movie before Stiller and Carey were involved. It was uh, Chris Farley was attached, and mm-hmm. it was going to be a broad like Beverly Hills mm-hmm. Ninja type comedy about a goofy cable guy. Thank God Stiller and Jim Carrey got involved <laughs> and found a wrinkle to make this twisted fun. Uh, only in the end, only in the very last scene is Jim Carrey really a danger to anyone. Yeah. Um, he's mostly harmless. He's just really annoying and weird and creepy and <laughs> loving it. Well, he does get him thrown into jail. <laughs> well, yeah. And he, he has him sleep with a prostitute without telling him it's a prostitute. Oh, man. He is so just sexually weird in this. He's like, you know, he, he sets uh, Matthew Broderick up with the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the prostitute and he's like no it's no worries i checked her out last week yeah <laughs> not uh, a drip not a drip <laughs> <That's so gross>. <laughs> yeah <laughs> and uh, he's looking at the the walls for the cable and everything he's like he's feeling around he's like tapping on it and rubbing it and everything he's like that's his sweet spot right there yeah he's got so much quotable material in this <laughs> i was probably one who contributed to that movie getting a lot of negative buzz because when i first watched it i didn't like it uh i i was 19 at the time and i was just sort of kind of going well it doesn't know what it wants to be is this a thriller or a comedy can't it be both (laughs) that's not what uh i i was thinking at the time and then later on saw it again and i saw it under a different light and you just realize that it's just just a super dark comedy and you just laugh when laugh when appropriate you know (laughs) um but uh but yeah cable guy is it possible that ben stiller might even still steal this movie from his stars by playing basically the menendez brothers (laughs) in this i think it was an asian gang like that's one of the things that come out of this movie the most maybe is that it's him doing that menendez brothers thing but yeah i i've grown i've grown to love this movie yeah it's a small role for an early jack black Mm -hmm. yeah and and kyle gas yeah real small role for kyle Kyle gas well and andy dick's in this movie andy dick is Mm -hmm. in the medieval garofalo yeah um ben stiller pulled a lot of his friends into this yeah yeah Uh, from the old ben stiller show which had like you know seven or eight episodes or mm -hmm. something like that but uh yeah I, I enjoy this movie quite a bit now. It's I feel like it's a classic even. But, yeah. But outside of this room, you're going to have a, a lot of people that uh, disagree with that. Yeah. Bastards. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Is All it right. me? Yeah, it is you. We're oh, going. you did Cable Guy. Yeah. He said so many good things about it that my brain decided that was Chris's <laughs> suggestion. All right. So I'm going to go with another 1995 movie that sadly did not make it into our earlier discussion. One of Batman Forever. Oh, yeah. No, one of my favorite, favorite movies, Assassins. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure this is Richard Donner. It is Richard Donner. Sylvester Stallone, Julianne Moore, and Antonio Banderas. Is there are... a lot of shouting in this? <laughs> Have you not seen it? Per Barrett. No, I've seen it. Oh, okay. But I haven't seen it since 1995. Um, oh, my God. <laughs> I bet God. it's shouty. I saw it like a month ago. It's not that shouty. Really? Uh, okay, so the premise is basically this. Uh, Stallone is an assassin, and he goes to kill his latest target. And some other assassin shows up. It's Antonio Banderas. And he kills the target. So Stallone goes back to his contact on the computer. He's like, What's the, what the fuck is up with that? There's another guy there. He's like, don't worry about it. We'll take care of that guy. Gets another assignment. Banderas steals that kill. <laughs> And so now Stallone is pissed, and he decides to go on the offensive, and they basically converge around Julianne Moore, the next target Banderas is going after, and Stallone decides to save her and her cat. <laughs> um and then they proceed to basically chase each other around the city and ultimately down to a Caribbean bank uh, where there's a sniper rifle involved and some of the past comes back to haunt somebody. I fucking love this movie so much. <laughs> now, Antonio Banderas has never been more fun, ever, ever, because he's constantly infusing this character with all these indefinite business things between dialogue where he like he'll breathe really fast or he'll like spew little bits of Spanish and he'll be like, ah, yeah. And he's constantly <laughs> like, he's almost acting like a cartoon character. He loves being an assassin and fucking with Stallone so much. He's having so much fun. I think that is the number one reason I enjoy this movie. There, I, 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 there's something that discolors this movie for me. And it might be the fact that Stallone during this time 
uh, did another movie called The Specialist the previous yeah. year, which was not, and he wasn't an assassin in that. I don't believe he's a bomb setter. Yeah, yeah, but he, but it, those two movies just kind of run together for me for whatever reason. It was there was a point where Stallone was just coming out with a lot of these D low rent movies and everything, and The Specialist was one, and then The Assassins came around, and I just didn't give it a fair shake. Well, I, I think, think Judge Dredd was ninety five too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't ever watch that. Yeah, <laughs> I just like the cat and mouse uh, competing assassin. Assassins and how much fun Banderas is having. I don't. I'm not even a really big Julie Ann Moore fan. I'm, I don't l- hate her, but I don't really like. Oh, she's great. I gotta watch her in this. Uh, but it's just a fun ride. Maybe I, maybe it hit me the right way. There's a scene early on where Stallone's driving a taxi, and Banderas finds him and gets in the back. And they know at this point who each other is, but there's bulletproof glass between them. And as he's driving along, like. Banderas kicks out the window and goes out the window with his gun silencer and stri- tries to start shooting Stallone in the driver's seat. And Stallone's trying to shoot him back. And it's just, ah, I love it. I think it's really fun. <laughs> yeah, I may have to watch this movie yeah, I think again I will too. because... Uh, but I should say Rotten Tomatoes has this at a 15%. Ooh, wow. A crushing 15%. Wow. <laughs> so go Maybe in, the lowest of any of the movies. Uh, go go, go in knowledgeable about that. And I think you might have fun. Um, the next one, we actually talked quite a bit about this movie today, but, uh, the quick and the dead is another one of yeah. those movies. Uh, it, 56% on Rotten Tomatoes, 53% of the users like it 6.4 on IMDb, which is middling, but I could not find anybody who enjoyed this movie with me. Like could not find anybody uh ever like the sharon stone thing back then just i it just ruined we didn't talk about casino either yeah oh I, shit yeah i yeah. wouldn't have said a lot of great things about casino yeah. Oh, really? yeah but that was one of her best performances was sure. because she got nominated for casino but uh but uh but the sharon stone thing man really like i think hurts this movie in the long run just because so many great actors are in it. Yeah. Russell Crowe didn't know who he was at the time until, you know, and he came out with two, you know, virtuosity as well. Um, he came out with two big movies this year and, and, uh, he's great. And Hackman's great. And DiCaprio is great. But I just love how Sam Raimi appears to just, he's still in his really having fun stage. Yeah. And, um, and, and he shoots a Western here that it's never been shot this way before. Uh, you might, I mean, you know, a lot of people like to point to Peck and Paw and like how he did the Wild Bunch and all that type of stuff. In the Wild Bunch, it's more about the violence, and Quick and the Dead, it's more about the 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 lead up to the violence, which is never you know terrible by any means. But um, but I I love the idea of just you know having having like a a contest basically a gunfighter sh- contest. And it's basically a uh, blood sport for gunfighters. Yeah, mm, yeah. Right? And uh, and Hackman is the 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 you know the leader of this town. He has a great speech that I love ranting through a lot. I know that whole thing. Yeah. Uh. But uh. But he's such a bad person in this, and like he's and unfortunately amazing at shooting people. <laughs> and and his confrontations with Lance Henriksen and Keith David in this movie. Keith David, I love the scene with Keith David because Keith David's like, he, hey, Hackman's like, I know you were hired to kill me you know so let's just go ahead and go ahead and do this and and um and uh and keith david's like well you know all right i was gonna plan it on killing you anyway so and then uh and then hackman's like when the when the clock strikes dawn i'll be i'll be making an example of you and uh, keith david's just like laughing like <laughs> <laughs> and then next thing like they have this awesome gunfight where <laughs> hackman has this big like basically he can't just he can't just kill this guy he has to really kill him and he has to he has to make an example of him and that's what he says i'm going to make an example of you um and then he, he tells the town you know look this is my town yeah. <laughs> you know i control everything and i just man this movie so good how did nobody like this movie that's what kills me about it anytime i see it i i'm just like seriously i had to i had to find people that like this movie so we just didn't know each other, you and me. That's at that true. Point. That's be true. Another four years before we meet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Mine is a criminally underseen comedy. Now it's not great by any stretch of the imagination, but it's fun, and it's a movie called Sex Drive. And I think yeah. that, I think that title kind of put people off a little bit uh, because it's more than that. Uh, it's it's a teen comedy. It's a teen sex comedy, but there's a lot of different. Uh, 
aspects of it to make it like wacky and fun. It's a uh, it's story about a kid that uh, falls in love with a girl online. She wants to meet him and that kind of thing. So he drives to Knoxville, Tennessee. Yes, he does. Wow. Uh, with his stolen, uh, steals his brother's car. And uh, it takes his friend, Clark Duke, uh, who is... <laughs> oh, Clark Duke is amazing. I have that. never seen a character like what t- Clark Duke uh, plays. He's a small, pudgy man-child. Lothario. <laughs> who <laughs> women absolutely adore. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, I, he gets in these weird sexual situations are just things that have to to do with his penis that are hilarious. Like, there's a, a woman that eventually goes down on him, and she's, I forget what she calls it, but she's got an Altoid in her mouth. And he's like, ooh, that is curiously strong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And then, oh. and, uh, it's, it's fun. Seth Green plays an Amish dude in there. And yeah, and he's hilarious. He is absolutely hilarious. I mean, he injects the whole thing with, like, this sarcasm that's biting, but fucking hilarious and it's it's totally worth seeing some of it's formulaic but yeah it's it's basically about a guy who is is being catfished basically yeah. um and uh and he thinks that and he's been he's been catfishing her back basically mm-hmm. saying that he's like this big football player and, yeah and everything and she's like oh man yeah I'm, I'm totally into this and all that and then it's like this cross-country trip to yeah. have sex yeah um but james marsden is so good in it yeah james marsden <laughs> seth green uh clark duke these are all like really fun performances yeah. in it um it's you know yeah not a great movie by any means but funny 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 it's movie. better than 45 percent on rotten tomatoes I think. yeah yeah i think so so check it out it's it's on like comedy central a lot and, and that kind of thing but yeah. watch the unedited version if you can it's funny the unedited virgin indeed <laughs> uh, all right i'm going right back to 1995 <laughs> to a movie we've mentioned a couple of times today the denzel washington russell crowe spectacular virtuosity, virtuosity. Nice. One of the most preposterous movies ever. Oh, yes. <laughs> because an AI character is going to, quote unquote, escape into the real world. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, for police training purposes, they created this AI by using like 125 serial killers. And they oh, used yeah. that, those people's brains to basically build the most psychotic unafraid, terrible bad guy ever so they can train against him because cops are always coming up against this kind of thing, right? <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> and you don't want to know how much virtual reality costs back then. Yeah. Um, so, of course, he escapes out into the real world, looks like Russell Crowe, sadistic. Uh, and of course, the only man that can stop him, let's go steal from Demolition Man and we'll pull up a former cop who's a prisoner out of prison because he took down one of the serial killers that makes up this guy's brain. Who killed his family, by the way? <laughs> of course, yeah. of course. Allowing Russell Crowe to say things to him throughout the movie like, how's your family? Still dead? <laughs> um, <laughs> and <laughs> a young Kaylee Cuoco is in this, believe it or not. Um, here's the reason I love this movie. I love a good shitty sci-fi movie that has a a cool premise an interesting premise like that justin timberlake movie in time Mm -hmm. i really enjoy that movie Mm -hmm. it's got a good enough premise that overcomes whatever's bad about it and i like going to that kind of a sci-fi world that doesn't exist but mostly it's russell crowe the same thing i was saying about banderas in assassins russell crowe is having so much fun yeah he's had and he's now known as a much more serious actor, yeah. right? Uh, quiet sometimes, but much more serious. And here he's smiling constantly. The character's clearly having fun because he's a sadist. But uh, Russell Crowe's having so much fun, it carries the entire preposterous plot for me all the way down to the end. There's, it's full of lines like that one that I quoted that are just laughably bad. <laughs> uh, there's this rant he does because Denzel says something about uh, God and he says which God <laughs> the God who created you or the God who created me because the God who created me has no balls <laughs> <laughs> and it's just I mean if you go into it going I mean you want to talk about a, a bad movie that's fun because it's bad this is one of those and I I really like watching it I can't I can't say much positive about it but 
I like it. But, I might even watch it tonight. Yeah, nice. <laughs> it's one of those. It's just one of those movies. I remember the trailer a lot for some reason. Just the, like, we're going to shut you down. I will not be shut down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, how is he going to prevent that? I want to see it. Um, but I, this is another movie I haven't seen since 1995. But uh, Oh, he's got an evil name, too. Sid 6.7. <laughs> S what? standing for uh, sadist. Uh, I standing for oh yeah <laughs> it, they're like the three descriptors of the worst criminal in the world uh, it spells Sid as, as an acronym or whatever nice it's the six point seventh version wow anyway. um last week we talked about how hardly anybody likes the Hudsucker proxy mm-hmm. and it's and and I'm not going to be talking about Hudsucker proxy here but that would be a a pretty good one actually but. Another Coen Brothers movie that nobody likes, and I bet nobody in this room likes, is The Lady Killers. Oh, oh yeah, you're right. And um, it's uh, 55% on Rotten Tomatoes, 43% of users like it, and it's got a 6.2 on the IMDb. I enjoyed this movie. Mm. And uh, it came out, yeah, no, <laughs> it's it's terrible of me. I I enjoy this for, it's, it's still got that Coen Brothers visual and like, great sight gags and Irma P Hall who plays the 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 mother that they stay at her house or whatever she's mm. fantastic Tom Hanks one of his most underappreciated performances I think I think even if you hate the movie you got to like him oh, yeah. in it and uh, he's really good and I just and uh, JK Simmons is in it mm. and, and Marlon Wayans <laughs> like Marlon Wayans in a Coen Brothers movie it's just so <laughs> weird but he's got that I love that part where like uh J.K. Simmons brings his girlfriend to the Waffle Hut, and Marlon Wayne's like, I can't believe you brought your bitch to the Waffle Hut. (laughs) It's stuff like that that just, like, there's so much, like, enough funny in it to make me like, all right, I kind of like this. This isn't the best by any means. They also came out with Intolerable Cruelty the same year, which I also don't like, but, Mm. but, uh, but. This the Lady Killers is is more than what I mean. It, it's it's a remake. It was I saw the original with uh, Alec Guinness is the oh, well, is the guy hmm. that uh, Tom Hanks and the original is really good. But um, but I just I like this movie for whatever reason, and it's just one of those movies. So well, do your I, thing. I have never seen it all the way through. I've only caught like. 10 15 minute stretches here and there flipping channels but i i remember thinking that hanks was entertaining me while i watched but yeah I, I couldn't say much more yeah i mean you yeah. have a, it's just a, a lot of great you know people and hanks and jk simmons is always great and marlon wayans completely different from what you normally but see, are so. any of them ai that escaped into the real world <laughs> <laughs> none of none can match virtuosity <laughs> None can match your your uh, movies that you brought up today. Yeah, the 1995 trifecta. The ni- yeah, the 1995 trifecta of sudden death, virtuosity, and... <laughs> Assassins. <laughs> Assassins. So we're going to Q&A now? Yeah, let's do it. Give me a Q. Question. Question. I got something to say. I want the truth. I am listening. And that will give you an A. Give me a Q. Mm. Okay. There is, just a reminder, there is a uh, thread in our subreddit, which is reddit slash r slash cinema sins correct reddit.com slash r slash cinema sins that you can leave your questions there uh we took these uh two questions from that thread uh you can also contact us on twitter at cinema sins or at music video sins and soundcloud and also use soundcloud um uh for questions we're keeping an eye on that so uh the first question we have today is what is the best role uh, that was out of character like a comedian playing a serious role or a serious actor in a comedy jeremy you want to start off Sure. Uh, Well, the first thing I thought of when I read this question was Tom Cruise in Tropic Thunder, uh, Mm -hmm. because even even though he's been funny before, um, I don't know that he's ever been in a flat out comedy uh, or at least in a role that was entirely for comedic purposes. Uh, It's usually just he's charming or funny in the midst of whatever else he's doing that's serious. Uh, but I actually want to talk about Jack Black in the movie Burning. Yeah. Um, have you guys seen this? I've never love seen it. Love it. I love that performance. This is based on a real dude mm-hmm. um, who was dating a much older woman. He's a funeral director, apparently very good at his job. Lonely, loner, kept to himself in large part. And then this woman dies. And I think in real life, there's speculation that he killed her. Um, he went to jail. Yeah, but he's out now. Yeah, he's out now. Um, but this is Jack Black like I've never seen him before. I never thought I would see Jack Black sing a hymn in a movie and not be joking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as the funeral director, he's singing these hymns that I remember hearing as a kid growing up. Um, 
he's not here to make jokes. He's weird. It's a little bit uh, humorous at times, but I'd never seen him do anything like this. Oh, he's sincere. He's absolutely sincere, and he plays this part apparently very much like the guy. He was so charismatic. I mean, everybody in the town knows this guy and loves him and was super shocked that he had any alleged in- involvement in this this whole uh, shenanigans. It's, yeah. it's awesome. It is. It's creepy. It's not like any other movie you're likely to see, uh, but if you want to talk about out-of-character performances, he's really good in it and uh, not being Jack Black at all. That's a great one. I'll have to check that out. I have, uh, well, gosh, I've got three listed here. I guess I'll do a combo. Um, Robin Williams and Jim Carrey both doing Peter Weir movies when they were uh, when they were known for for comedy. Mm. Uh, Robin Williams and Dead Poet Society. I'd have never had never seen Robin Williams that way. He had done some dramatic stuff before this, but this was the one that really um said he can do dramatic stuff and robin williams and dead poet society is fantastic it actually came on this morning <laughs> no. i sat there and watched it while i was doing some other stuff uh but he's fantastic in it jim carrey in the truman show yeah. another peter weir um carrey obviously known nothing but but for madcap comedy at this point um he is ridiculously good in this too like it's you, you would i actually thought maybe robin williams could pull out dead poet society i did not think jim carrey could pull off truman show mm-hmm. and uh, he did he really knocked it out of the park yeah. awesome. another movie ed harris is awesome in yes absolutely. Oh, yeah. and another character with a really on the nail uh, no uh, name Kristoff. Uh, Kristoff, <laughs> yes where he even says i am the creator with a slight hitch yeah yeah, of a of a television show. <laughs> I'm going to go with another Al Pacino performance from 1997, strangely enough, and uh, talk about him playing against type, a certain type in Donnie Brasco. Mm-hmm. Oh. So Al Pacino, it's still a mob movie. Uh, he's still in the mob and he still plays a gangster, but he plays a completely different type of gangster than we've ever seen him play. Saddest gangster ever. Yeah, I know. He is just, just schlubby and he's just a sad sack. You know, he, he's the polar opposite of Michael Corleone. And uh, he's he's just trying to make it. Uh, he's trying to be a made man. He's trying to make it up in the mob and everything. But he's clearly too old, right? At this point, he's, he's probably old. lost his chance. Yeah. Uh, there's that scene where he gives Johnny Depp a card with a bunch of cash in it for his birthday, which the gangsters are doing all throughout the movie. But then he asks for some of it back because yeah, <laughs> yeah. he's so poor. <laughs> he got some puzzles. Uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, so, oh, I agree. I agree this is against type because much like Tom Cruise, Al Pacino is almost always a hot shot. Mm-hmm. Whatever, whether he's good or bad, whatever his profession, he's a hot shot. Yeah. And in this one, he is the very opposite. He's at the bottom. Yeah. I uh, love it. I he's love such that a sad sack. Yeah. Yeah. Another, yet another Johnny Depp performance, by the way. Yeah. That doesn't get nominated. Oh, yeah. he's great. Joel Pistone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, our next question is, what scenes do you often find yourself wanting to rewatch, even without the context of the movie, like on YouTube or just skipping ahead on the Blu-ray? Uh, Jeremy, what you think? Uh, well, the one I'm going to mention, there are a bunch. I, I want to talk about the Untouchables train mm, station sequence, mm-hmm. uh, but instead I'm going to go with the uh, Fenway robbery at the end of the town. Ooh, nice. yeah. Yeah. Um, which builds up to the shootout, uh, which is the big climax of the film. Uh, it's a good 30 minutes of movie devoted to this one heist. But I love everything about it, from the way they look exactly like cops to the the, the, the shit they shout at the guys in the money room and how they both have the same wife's name. Yeah. Like, <laughs> your wife also, Lori, or whatever her <laughs> name is. Um and then, you know, it, it does eventually escalate into a full-on gun battle. They change back into other clothes to try to escape out as cops. God, I love this movie so much, but it just builds and builds and builds to the perfect conclusion for me. And I don't I don't need the context. I know it. I've seen this movie a bunch, but I don't need the context. You just know, okay, here's some robbers who are going to hit a baseball stadium, which is a target I've never seen in any heist movie, yeah. right? Uh, you've seen casinos and banks and jewelry stores, but I've never seen anybody rob a sporting venue. Mm-hmm. Um, so that one, I ha- I've been known to pop that in just for that scene. <laughs> I was at Fenway Park when they premiered this movie. Oh, wow. Um, they had, uh, I was there right before because there's a restaurant in the, the Green Monster, actually, that you can look over onto the field. And uh, they were setting up for the premiere uh, of, of that movie. And I love it, man. It reminds me a lot, actually, of Jeremy Renner's character. reminds me a lot of Val Kilmer and Heat mm-hmm. and yeah. that whole conclusion, yeah. too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
I had uh, quite a few written down too, but I'm going to pick No Country for Old Men. Um, the scene where he is running across the desert that eventually leads to a river and a dog chasing after yeah. him. Yeah. Mm paddling towards him like you don't expect the dog to be able to chase after this guy but he's just like and so like brolin is like swimming across this river where the dog chasing after him and he gets to the gets to land and he has to like pull out his gun load the gun do all this other stuff before the dog finally gets to him and everything i love that scene so much and there's another one in no country for old men too like it's just the um, just the whole like scene where he's in the hotel and oh. everything is another great one that you can mm-hmm. watch on YouTube over and over. No Country for Old Men's got some great shit in it, uh, but that's that's one I, I I'd like to watch just out of context. Just those, just that scene, those nice. scenes over again. Yes, I love that movie so much. You guys went with intense. Uh, do you guys like the Simpsons movie? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. I, I kind of felt the same way. It was it wasn't great. It I, it wasn't objectionable or anything like that. But one thing that I really loved and that I watch an inappropriate amount of times on YouTube is when Homer has the pig up on the ceiling and he goes, "Spider pig, spider pig <laughs> does whatever a spider pig does. Can he swing from a web? No, he can't. He's a pig." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and Mars is like, why are there pig tracks on the ceiling? <laughs> anyway, yeah. I watch that a lot. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> no, we can't. He's a pig. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, that will be the Sincast for this week. Continue going to SoundCloud and telling uh, telling us what you think of the show. And uh, so, but that'll be it for this week. This is Chris Atkinson, Jeremy Scott, and Barrett Share. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Comment on our episodes on our SoundCloud page. Check us out on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Reddit. And be sure to visit cinemasins.com. Troy. Let's <laughs> pretend like we have like some production assistant named Troy. Troy. And- <laughs> We're always yelling at him. <laughs> Fucking Troy. God damn it, Troy. You know, like on those radio shows, they, they always talk about their producer, but you never hear the producer. <laughs> yeah, they just get shit. Our producer is Troy. You fucking suck, Troy. I no longer sound shitty. Oh, good. He still sounds shitty to me. <laughs> Don't tell Chris that he sounds shitty. Hey, Barrett. Troy, <laughs> keep it quiet. Ha ha! Ha ha! Ha ha! That felt good in my ears. I'm sorry. That's good, actually. That gave me a I peek. do the cha-cha like a little girl. <laughs> <laughs> that was my Bruce Almighty right there. Yeah. Back to you, fuckers. <laughs> That's one of the best F-bombs in movie history. I that think. was that uh, is a good one. That was a good crowd reaction F-bomb. Because oh, yeah. I used to go, because that was at Hollywood 27 when that came out. I used to go over when uh, it was opened and number it was in number one I remember and I came in either Friday or Saturday night and uh, and there's that scene with him on the boat at Niagara Falls and everything back to you fuckers and you just see everybody <laughs> just like fall out during yeah, that part just so not expecting that yeah Maud a eh? um Maud rolling 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 there's a simpsons and i can't remember exactly the context but there's something about Maud and homer's like blah 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 eh and they're like yeah and he's like Maud eh <laughs> <laughs> it's like when he asks that lady to explain what vip means and mm-hmm. she goes through all of them and then he goes and the eye <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, uh, now we're going to be talking about um, some things and some stuff. Stuff and things. Excitement. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, what what is the topic today? Guilty Shit. pleasures. It's guilty pleasures. Yep. <laughs> Someone did their show prep. N- well, I had it written down, oh. and I was like, where did it go? <laughs> I'll tell you, the first time I watched that movie was with my brother, and we both fell asleep during it. <laughs> and, I can see that. And we woke up at the park, right at the park, and we started busting it, just busting laughing. Uh Billy Bob Thornton's like, shut your goddamn mouth and eat your beans. <laughs>
That's Iggy Pop in that scene. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the dress. We forgot to talk about Boys on the Side. Mm-hmm. Shit. And Batman Forever. Yeah, Batman oh, Forever. Batman God forever. damn it. We did, and Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Shit. <laughs> A goofy movie. A goofy movie. Brady Bunch movie. Yeah, I mean. Let's just name shit. Yeah, just name <laughs> movies over and over. Welcome to the Dollhouse. I uh, liked Welcome to the Dollhouse. I did too. Yeah. Just didn't mention it. Park we did Posey. now. That was my introduction to Heather Mata's de Bazo Bazzaro. Yeah, me too. <laughs> she's she's in the movie that I'm going to talk about in a second. Is she really? <laughs> Hostel two. <laughs> um, she that's my gu- gu- yeah. If Hostel two is your guilty pleasure, there's something <laughs> fucked. You up. are totally fucked up. <laughs> um, 